Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. How is everyone? Thank you for being here. I want to get started on time. Um, appreciate everyone coming today, community members, uh, members of the press, city staff, uh, uh, anybody watching this presentation remotely as well. I also want to thank, we have a couple council members here, Sue Scambaluri and Kate Rosenbarger. Thank you for being here. Um, just very quickly, uh, I'm going to give very brief remarks, and then you'll hear from uh, three others, uh, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So we're going to go through presentations and then uh, open it up for questions after that. Since 2017, uh, as mayor, I have directed our public safety leaders to present a year in review to the community that we serve. We need an accurate picture of safety and quality of life in Bloomington, not just anecdotal and subjective perspectives. By presenting data about crime, fire calls, investments, training, and much more that you'll hear about this morning, we can see how well we are progressing and identify any persistent problems in order to address them. Our commitment in public safety to transparency and accountability is pervasive beyond just today's important annual presentation throughout the year anyone can access specific information related to public safety whether crime statistics vehicle deployments budget information much more uh, at our open data portal be clear with 200 and plus data sets that are constantly updated and uh, the resident uh, filled board of public safety that meets monthly in public session for all to hear regular detailed reports on our activities. Among the responsibilities we bear as city government, keeping our residents safe is job one. Uh, I want to salute the members of our police and fire departments for the challenging work that you do so professionally every day, always putting your life on the line for all of us who live, work, and visit here in Bloomington. We know our public safety personnel, including the CFRD, often engage with us most directly on some of the most difficult or dangerous days of our lives. But the work you do throughout the year, forging connections within the community, preventing problems before they occur, educating us about opportunities, and your ongoing commitment to justice, equity, and inclusion does so much to keep the number of those worst days to a minimum. Very briefly, just summarizing, starting with the police department, I want to commend you on an overall reduced incidence of crime of nearly 5%, even as our population increases and continuing a three-year pattern of those overall reductions. I will caution uh, the new uh, d data system, which uh, Chief Decoff will talk about, is different from the Uniform Crime Report which merits uh, some attention, but I'll also note it's been a tough year. Chief Decoff will explain we have serious concerns about gun violence, gun activities, and certain types of crime that are increasing in a real concern. 2019 saw a sharp rise in gun violence and aggravated assaults. Uh, you'll, you'll note and hear from Chief Decoff uh, some of the details of, of what we know about those assaults and how that rise may also co correlate with an increase in reporting, which is a positive, uh, and talk about their next steps uh, addressing those. There was also a rise in opioid-related events by 13 percent, and the chief will talk about what that figure means uh, and doesn't mean uh, in, in correlating to deaths. Um, the natural, national crisis may be plateauing, but we continue to see effects locally. Uh, you'll also hear about challenges at the farmer's market and increasing security costs there and stress on the officers, uh, and we look forward to hearing about that. Uh, you'll also hear, I'm pleased to report, about an increased emphasis on new programs and uh, funding to support and serve residents so that situations do not escalate and to expand the department's engagement, connections, and trust with the public, including a crisis diversion center, new social worker, I see Melissa here, thank you, uh, neighborhood resource specialists, and a new uh, switchyard substation. Also, you'll hear about technology upgrades, including the new reporting system, which the Chief will explain, body cam upgrades, and more. Uh, you'll also hear about the continued extensive commitment to continued training accomplishing nearly four times what the state requires, including training on de-escalation, 
anti-bias training, female leadership, mental health first aid, and more. Uh, after Chief, Chief Dekoff, you'll hear from uh, Safe and Civility Justice uh, Leader, Community Family Resource Department, Director Beverly Callender Anderson, which is also a critical and important part of our approach to fostering safety, quality of life, equity, inclusion, and a welcoming environment here in town. Uh, Ms. Callender Anderson will share with you how the initiative of uh, the Safe Civil Just initiative, which began uh, over three years ago in late 2016, has implemented its recommendations. Uh, she'll go through those details and also mention the addition of the After Hours Ambassador as one of those recommendations. Jen is here, thank you, as a significant step in promoting those, and she'll talk about what that means in our community. Uh, we're looking forward to further measures to increase safety and civility uh, as well, including helping Mon Bloomington Monroe and other items. Uh, third, you'll hear from Chief Moore uh, from the Fire Department, who will report again, gratefully, that there were no fire fatalities in Bloomington in 2019 and two saves. That's the third straight year of no fatalities in our city. This achievement reflects the department's education and prevention efforts, uh, reduced times in getting to the scene, enhanced training, 46,000 hours of training for our 100 firefighters, enhanced equipment and uh, additional connections in the community. Our uh, ISO rating, which uh, Chief Moore will explain, puts us in the top 2% of rated departments in the United States top 1% of departments in Indiana and the best rated department in our county. We appreciate the public safety local income tax, our partnership with Indiana University that's letting us acquire the gear and apparatus that we need, including a new 100-foot aerial apparatus in May that we pushed in. Uh, we'll welcome another ladder truck this month and a second round of personal protective equipment for our firefighters. Um, the fire department is a very innovative department and have showcased uh, resourcefulness and ingenuity, including, uh, I don't know if we have a picture of our low cost model for drying fire suits uh, uh, and uh, the contract of letting each firefighter get masks that allow for visibility in smoky conditions uh, that, that they can uh, each have. A uh, new contract has gotten these masks for us, uh, as well as a quick response vehicle and others. So, I'm going to get out of the way. I want to close. Thank you for being here to hear about this and, and, and just note um, my personal appreciation and on behalf of our community for three uh, outstanding leaders uh, who helped lead our public safety efforts from Chief, Mika, Chief Mike Dekoff, uh, Director Beverly Callender Anderson, and Chief Jason Moore. We are privileged and honored to have them serving our community and uh, we'll begin their detailed presentations with Chief Dekoff first. Thanks a lot, Chief. Good morning. So this is our first slide, our mission statement, which we have uh, posted on lots of different social media outlets is right there. We're gonna jump right in. The organizational chart, we have 186 total personnel. They're broken down into sworn personnel, which are the uniformed, and uniformed police officers and detectives of our department. Um, we have parking enforcement, which is also under the police department, and our non-sworn personnel, which is our dispatchers and our records clerks. Let's go into training. We conducted over 9,600 hours of training last year. Um, that is four <coughs> times what is required by the state of Indiana. Um, you can see on the right-hand side um, some of the major categories that we focus on. Um, all of our uh, sworn personnel and some of our non-sworn personnel have been through mental health, health first aid. Uh, we focus a lot on de-escalation, anti-bias training. Uh, we we uh, train a lot in interview schools, a lot of specialty courses for investigations. Investigations have become quite um, uh, detailed with how you go about investigating those. So there's a lot of financial crimes that we investigate that require a lot of specialty training. So you can see some of those other things, uh, emergency medical training. A lot of times we will beat the fire department and the ambulances to uh, emergency medical runs, and we can start that basic uh, first aid training until the more trained professionals in our fire department and ambulance services, they have to plug for you there, um, come, uh, come and take over. Personnel hiring and recruiting. So in 2019, we had 12 new officers that were hired. They were hired to replace officers who retired or left our agency for other reasons. 
Four of those people were previously certified police officers, which means we did not have to send them to the law enforcement academy. Uh, the remaining eight attended the Indiana Law Enforcement Academy, and once they completed graduation, they entered our 16-week field training program. Uh, together, all of the training of those 12 hours encompassed in excess of 8,600 hours. Uh, what's important to remember is when we hire someone that is not already a police officer and we have to send them to the Law Enforcement Academy, that is a uh, uh, program that the state runs it, uh, and there are a limited number of seats that we can get in there. So that hampers sometimes our hiring efforts because if they don't have any open slots uh, for people that we hire, we can't get them trained. Talk a little bit about overtime uh, for the department. In 2019, our total overtime costs were $1,007,941 compared to 2018, which were $788,488. Um, you can see the major categories um, that we spend overtime in uh, are downtown patrols, which are additional patrols in the downtown area. Um, uh, is basically done almost every day at varying hours. Uh, shift coverage is when we are short on shifts and we have to have um, uh, officers uh, come in to meet those minimum sh uh, staffing levels. Uh, detective investigations, uh, those are cases that they would be investigating that would, would require them to work additional hours beyond their regular shift. Training um, is, is in there also. Dispatch, a lot of the dispatch overtime is for holiday pay and things like that. Uh, records is the same um, for, for a total. Now, the big singular events that I want to talk a little bit about um, is Farmer's Market and Little 500. Though Little 500 was typically a special event every year that we spent the most amount of overtime on. However, in 2019, we spent um, quite a bit of money in overtime on Farmer's Market, and that was to have additional personnel there to make sure that uh, nothing happened and to make sure that people felt safe. You can see the comparison from 2018 Obviously, we took it very seriously in 2019 um, and will continue in 2020 to meet whatever challenges that we might face. Talk a little bit about crime um, right now for comparing 2018 and 2019. You will see some significant increases in 2019 in violent crime. Um, rapes had a significant jump. Um, in 2018, they dropped, but in 2017, which I'll get to the 10-year comparison in just a minute, 2017 saw similar numbers as 2019. Um, a lot of those sexual assaults that we investigate um, involve people who know each other. And so since this continues to be a trend with violent crime, one of the things that we are going to do is um, try to work and partner with, with Middleway and work on education efforts. I believe, and I, um, I think Middle Way also in conversations I have had with them, believe that that increase is due to better reporting. Um, a couple years ago when it spiked, Indiana University um, had, had focused a lot on talking about sexual assaults and getting students to report crimes. And, and so the better reporting is, is certainly what we want. Um, but the numbers are, are high and we certainly don't want that. So we will be working with different partners to see what we can do to try to um, raise awareness and, and prevent these crimes from happening to begin with. We saw a slight increase in robberies from last year. Many of those robberies, um, the victim also knows the, the suspect. Um, the definition of robbery, the way that we, we have to um, report our statistics according to the FBI, um, some of those are involved in domestic battery situations. So if someone forcibly takes property from someone, that's classified as a robbery. So in a lot of domestic violence type situations, someone might, might forcibly take car keys from somebody. We have to classify that also as a robbery. Aggravated assaults continue to be a problem area for us. A lot of those, again, involve people who know each other. And so those are types of things that we're going to try to figure out ways to um, work with partners to raise awareness to try to, to um, uh, stop some of those, those uh, assaults. Um, those numbers continue to increase. It's, it's problematic. Um, it's stuff that happens when the police aren't around, so it's hard to prevent those types of crimes. So we're going to work on efforts in 2020 to lower those numbers. You can see we had significant decreases in burglaries. Um, when I get to the 10-year trend, you will see that that has continued to decrease. 
Thefts are down and so is vehicle theft. Here is the 10 year comparison. If you noticed uh, on the right side, burglary, larceny and vehicle theft are property crimes. One thing that we attribute to the decrease in those crimes year after year is several years ago, we added a crime analyst position to the department. That person works directly with the detectives she looks at patterns and so we've taken the information and we've gotten it out to our patrol officers so that they change their patrol areas so that they can hopefully um, provide a deterrence to people who might want to commit property crimes our investigators are using the information to um, uh, follow up and make arrests in these types of cases and so we continue to see the decreases in property crime each year and one of the main reasons we believe that to be the case is, is better information and, and uh, supplying that information to our officers. Our calls for service comparison. A call for service is anytime someone calls the police department for anything, it's a call for service. So we've broken it down into categories. You can see the different ones. Clearly the largest area is service calls. That can be just about anything. So if someone calls in and says, um, hey, I saw a car parked illegally on a curb, yellow curb, that would be a call for service. If I saw someone called in and said, um, there's a fight in progress, all of those, if they don't fit into a particular area, would be under the service call. Gun violence, the mayor mentioned that we've had a sharp increase. We have, as you can see in 2019, we had 172 calls involving a firearm. It's a 41% increase in the number of crimes committed with a firearm. Um, what is troubling is we are seeing an increasing number of juveniles found with firearms. Aggravated assaults, they continue to increase. Um, it's defined by the federal government as an unlawful attack by one person upon another for the purpose of inflicting severe or aggravated bodily injury. This type of assault usually is accompanied by the use of a weapon by means likely to produce death or great bodily harm. We had an increase of 26, almost 27% in 2019 over 2018. This is a troubling figure. Almost 50% of the aggravated assaults re uh, results for, or resulted from a domestic or interpersonal relationship violence. That is where we believe we might be able to make some impact and are gonna partner with uh, uh, people in the community to help us bring those numbers down. In over 80% of the cases, the victim and suspect knew each other. And over 64% of these crimes occur in a residence, which, which makes it hard for us to be able to do any kind of, of uh, patrolling or anything to deter those types of crimes. Let's keep everything in perspective though. So violent crime is up, but overall our crime decreased by almost 5% in 2019. Um, it's, it's important to remember though that crime um, is not random. Um, a lot of crime involves people who know each other. Um, and again, I've mentioned we're going to partner with different advocacy groups and social service agencies to help launch educational campaigns to try to bring these numbers down. <coughs> Substance use disorder, let's talk a little bit about the opioid crisis. Our calls for service on these events such as welfare checks and suspicious circumstances increased by 13% in 2019. Um, what's important to remember though is all of our officers carry naloxone but the number of times we've had to administer that dropped by 22% last year. So what that is showing us, I don't have death details because that is information that the coroner has, um, but what that is showing me is that we are responding to fewer overdoses where someone is dying but we are still responding to opioid related type calls. So again, um, I'll talk a little bit here about um, some things that we hope will help that, um, but it is still a, a slight increase last year uh, versus the previous year. Talk a little bit about traffic stops. 2019, we saw a decrease in those stops compared to 2018. You can see the multi-year trend in those stops. They have gone down. Um, Part of the reason for that is probably an increase in service related calls and the officers um, uh, are not having as much time to focus on traffic enforcement. Talk a little bit about our records division. Uh, this is some information that, that uh, they report out. So 
We had 10,259 case reports that the police department processed, and there were um, over 11,000 supplemental reports. So if we do an investigation and the officer calls in the initial report and then a detective follows up on that report and does casework, that is in the 11,000 figure. Um, you can see we had over 2,000 public access requests. Anyone who would want any information about a police report and files a public information request, it would come through the police department and we would process that um, and, and get that information out. They stay very busy uh, processing a lot of our records that we, that we generate here at the police department. We'll talk a little bit about NIBRS and UCR. So in 2019, the police department uh, transitioned from reporting un the Uniform Crime Report, which is a federal report that is required for police departments to fill out on part one crime statistics. We transitioned to the, the NIBR system, which is the National Incident-Based Reporting System. It gets very confusing when you start to talk about these two systems because they are different. Um, UCR reported basically uh, the top seven crimes that are called part one crimes. NIBRS reports everything. So the best way to kind of explain this is if you, I'm gonna just gonna take a hypothetical case and tell you the differences in that. So let's say that we are, we get called to a, uh, a, a domestic and we respond. So in that domestic, um, there's a battery that's committed, but then there's also the forcible taking of property, which would be a robbery. So under the Uniform Crime Report reporting information, you would report the most serious crime, which would be the robbery. Under NIBRS, you report everything. So what that's going to do is it's going to take what information that is, is uh, published by the federal government in the Uniform Crime Report, and it's going to expand the reporting criteria and the numbers. So you will start to see increases in crime data because of NIBRS. So it's, it's very important not to compare the two because they're different. NIBRS is a much more thorough reporting system. It will give us a much better picture of what is actually happening. UCR reports the most major categories of those crimes. Again, we entered a partial year, so we don't have a lot of information to compare um, year to year. So the comparisons that I've used in this presentation are UCR, is UCR data. It is not NIBRS data. So as we move forward and we have more NIBRS data um, in our system, we'll be able to compare that information um, to the previous year, which will give you a better picture of the, uh, the types of crimes that are being committed. Parking operations, in 2019, uh, there were 20,430 parking citations written. That is a 36% decrease from 2018. Um, one of the, there's two things that we attribute to that decrease. There was a raise in parking fines and the parking ordinances um, were, were uh, clarified. Um, there was some confusion and one of the main things with that was the city used to have the free three hours parking and they switched back to there is no more three hour free parking. So there was a lot of confusion with that which resulted in a lot of parking tickets. So since that's been clarified, we've issued less citations. It has not really impacted the, um, the revenue that is raised from those citations. It is, it is uh, about the same uh, from 2018 to 2019. Other uh, details that parking enforcement provides for us, they help with traffic direction at special events. Uh, when we have major road closings, they help out with directing traffic for those types of things also. Um, they also provide a continuous presence in the downtown area and in our neighborhoods. There are vehicles, that is a picture of one, it is, it is marked, um, and they have radios and computers in there so that they can also see what's going on. There are extra eyes and ears for the officers um, that are out working um, in the city. Central Dispatch is also under the police department. This is a, a snapshot of the calls for service that they had. There were 54,000 uh, calls for service to the Bloomington Police Department. Ellettsville had 7,000. Uh, the county had uh, just over 42,000 and Steinsville had 491. Highlights for last year. Uh, we were accredited in 2018, but in 2019 we saw our first um, review that we had to pass. We did successfully pass that. 
Um, we do those each year up until we are reaccredited um, uh, in a couple more years. So we continue to do a CALEA and make sure that our, our policies and best practices are being followed. We started our social worker program last year. We were the first in the state to do that with a full-time police social worker. Um, her job was to assist individuals and families that were experiencing uh, a lot of different issues. She partnered with our downtown resource officers and she got referrals from a lot of our other patrol officers and, and investigators on situations that they observed where they didn't know what they could, could do to help. They referred them to our social worker, uh, which she has been a, a huge asset to the department. You can see in 2019, she averaged 13 new referrals each month for a total of 683 interactions with clients throughout the year. We also started last year our neighborhood resource specialists. Uh, they were hired to work with neighborhoods on nuisance types issues and also to uh, attend meetings with neighborhood associations and basically facilitate dialogue between neighborhood groups and the police department. Uh, they spent much of their time last year working with at-risk communities. Um, we uh, hired two new ones at the end of the year, um, so we're, we're, we continue that program. They're just, they're not fully trained, so they're getting, they're getting that final training before they, um, they're out on their own. Downtown patrol, we mentioned that earlier. Uh, we continue to uh, dedicate people to uh, foot patrols and additional vehicle patrols in the downtown. Um, areas and the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, in addition to the, the, those parking operations has helped along with that. Uh, we continued a program last year that we had with the Indiana University Police Department where we hired six of their part-time officers to help us in those endeavors downtown. Um, as a result of that, um, our, our uh, call volume in the downtown area remained consistent with 2018 levels. And you can see the difference there in 2019, we had 8,783 calls for service. In 2018, we had 8,775. So about eight calls difference over the year, the two years. Public engagement. We spend a lot of time uh, trying to engage with the public on a positive way to break down barriers and to improve communication. Um, we had 363 different community engagement events last year. That's an increase of over 177% from 2018. You can see on the right some of the different things that we do. One of our, our, our big ones that we like to talk a lot about is our Teen Academy. For the last couple of years, we've opened that up to youth in the community um, from the ages 13 to 18. Uh, last year, it was completely full. Um, the kids had a, uh, a lot of fun. We teach them a lot of things about what police officers do. Um, and it's, it's a really positive program for the youth in our community and our officers really enjoy interacting with them. Another one is the Explorers. We've actually transitioned from the Explorer program to the Public Safety Cadet program. Um, what's, what I'd like to note about that is um, we are in the process of hiring someone that actually was one of our first uh, young, young people in that program to be a police officer. So that was our goal when we started it, was to try to use it as a recruiting method. Um, it is finally paying off. We are getting ready to hire one. There is another uh, kid that went through our program that is currently in the IU Police Academy. So we've, we've, we've accomplished what we set out to do with that, which was to uh, uh, bring young people into the law enforcement profession. Our Citizens Academy is very popular also. It's an 11-week program that we usually start in August. And we try to go over many of the aspects of the police department so that anyone attending that would have a, have a really good picture of what we do. Um, that continues to um, increase in popularity also. So those are some of the other programs listed. Um, and uh, we, we try to uh, uh, engage a lot because what we have found and what studies have found is that if you have these open dialogues and these, these types of programs where you're engaging with the public, you build trust and that's, that's certainly what we wanna do. Our mobile field office, there's a picture of that. It, it was new in 2019. Um, this picture is actually from the 4th of July this year, so we pull it out at major events. It becomes a focal point if someone needs to, to contact emergency services. Um, it's well marked, and so people can go there to report things. It also is designed to operate as a, a backup dispatch facility if something would happen to our dispatch um, center. Uh, we did use it um, or have it available um, at the end of or at the beginning of this year when we had to take the dispatch center down because of some uh, upgrades we needed to do to the electrical system. 
um, and it, it worked perfectly. Body-worn cameras and in-car cameras. This, uh, in 2019, we upgraded our body-worn camera system. Um, you can see we gather about 50 gigabytes of video data every 24 hours. So we record a lot of information. Um, we, we completely outfitted all of the officers with new cameras. We've also upgraded all of our in-car uh, in car cameras in our, in our uh, vehicles so we can record um, when we're driving also. A new, a new function in 2020 is we are upgrading um, the, the uh, system so that uh, there will be sensors in the officer's holster. So anytime the firearm, they would draw their firearm, it would automatically turn the camera on. Talk a little bit about our data sharing and transparency. So uh, back when the mayor started his, his uh, term as mayor in the first term, um, he asked me to look into this and we joined the uh, police data initiative. Um, it was ran out of uh, the Department of Justice. It has now switched to the police foundation. We continue to report to that. We report 14 data sets in 2020. We're adding two data sets to that. We will be adding uh, vehicle pursuits and traffic accidents to those data sets. Those data sets are also available on the city's Be Clear portal um, and you can access that through the city's website. 2020, some major goals that we have. Uh, we are starting to work on um, a crisis diversion center. You might have heard a little bit of discussion about that. Um, I'll get into that in just a minute. The other major thing that we're going to do in 2020 is we've opened our uh, substation at the Switchyard Park. There's been a lot of discussion in the community and around the country about pre-arrest diversion. Uh, we've been doing that many years. Uh, our, our downtown resource officer, officer program is an example of a pre-arrest diversion where we take someone that um, has committed a minor crime and we divert them into um, treatment or services that, that they might need to, per, to uh, help break that cycle of, of committing crimes. These are some examples of that, but the big one that I want to talk about is the Crisis Diversion Center. So there's been a, a, a group of of concerned citizens that have been meeting for quite a while um, talking about how we can do things better. Um, one, of those, one of those things was what do we do about the, the number of people who have um, substance use issues or mental health issues that get, it, get arrested. And so we are going to be starting a pre-arrest diversion program in 2020 that will divert people that have done minor crimes away from the justice system and get them into treatment. It was a uh, big effort to, to do all of this. One of the things that we needed to do those was we needed to establish a crisis diversion center before we started any program like that because we needed a place to divert people to. So with a collaborative effort of a lot of different people, um, there was some, uh, a program was put together that has a $2.1 million budget Half of that money was, uh, it will be funded with a grant through the IU Health Foundation. The other half is, along, is from matching funds from local businesses as well as the city and the county. This is a big deal. There's not a lot of places in Indiana or around the country, I think, that could leverage this kind of support to get something like this done. And it was done in a relatively quick time. Um, it's going to be administered by Centerstone. Um, We've had a long and very successful relationship with Centerstone. They've, they've been a partner with us in our downtown resource officer program. The really important thing about this is it will take someone who might have been in crisis or someone who might have committed a minor crime and immediately get them into this, this center to get them help. That is, that is huge. That is one thing that we have, we have not had the opportunity to do in this community. Um, so we're, we're very excited about this. Um, to see what type of impact we can have in these people's lives to turn them around and, and get them out of um, the issues that they might be struggling with. Our Switchyard Station, we just moved into it a couple of weeks ago. Um, it is in the Switchyard Park. Currently, it will not be, it will not be opened um, for like business hours like the police department is, but we are staffing our downtown resource officers out of there and our neighborhood resource specialists. They will be working out of there um, the intent right now is when we have when there are major events at the park, we will have it open. If someone needs any kind of emergency services, they can come. We have a lobby 
Um, it's a very nice facility. It also has a meeting room that we will um, open up to neighborhood associations and people who might want to meet there. Um, again, it's, it's a, a partnership with the Parks Department so that we can have a, a presence in the park um, that will helpful, help us do more outreach in the park um, and kind of be a community space for everyone. That concludes my presentation. Next. Next, I would like to introduce Beverly Calendry Anderson, the Director of the Community and Family uh, Resources Department. Good morning. So in August of 2016, Mayor Hamilton introduced the uh, city initiative to address downtown safety, civility, and justice issues. Uh, the initiative addressed concerns of downtown patrons, business owners, Bloomington residents experiencing homelessness or living in poverty, and the health and safety of city staff who maintained our city parks and other public areas. A deliberative dialogue process was designed and uh, implemented by the Community Justice and Mediation Center, and that, addressed, that enabled stakeholders to address their fears and their hopes for safety downtown through focus groups, stakeholder dialogue, and public deliberation. The Safety, Civility, and Justice Task Force was formed out of those meetings uh, with the goal of studying the issues raised in the deliberative dialogue process, examining best practices and relevant research to make recommendations to the mayor to improve safety, civility, and justice in downtown Bloomington. The task force met, as you can see, from February to June of 2017 and submitted recommendations in the following areas of increasing an official presence along Kirkwood and, and all around the downtown, increasing programming in city parks, uh, sanitation, education and training, funding, providing resources and services to low-income persons and those experiencing poverty. Um, out of those recommendations were implemented are, are, and are continuing to be implemented, but started to be implemented in about April of 2017, and we continue. One of the recommendations was to have a community coordinating council. That community coordinating council oversaw all of the recommendation implementation. So we met quarterly to um, see what was going on, see if there were new issues that were arising, um, and they finished their work in December of 2019. So to highlight some of the recommendation updates, uh, some of the recommendations that were implemented, we increased programming in the parks. One of the ways we did that was by waiving fees for nonprofits and student groups. And then there was a collaboration between downtown businesses. They actually helped fund um, groups and organizations that wanted to uh, come to the park and present programming. And at one point, I think about five days a week, we had some kind of programming going on in People's Park. We implemented a mental health first aid and mental health 101 training for community members. Chief Decoff talked about it for staff, but this was for community members. We trained 197 people from various sectors in the community. Uh, we created a public-private partnership that helped to expand programming um, and weekend services to Sh at Shalom Center. So prior to this, Shalom was only open five days a week. Now they're open seven days a week. Um, the first commitment was for 12 months between, it was the city and several other groups and the city um, up there, their commitment for the next 12 months after the first commit was, was concluded. So we did that recently. Uh, Parks and Rec created a jobs program that employs Centerstone clients to help them gain job skills and earn income while keeping city parks clean. Um, Chief Decoff mentioned the part-time officers at BPD hired to increase foot patrols in the downtown and the two neighborhoods, specialists and social worker, and they all help supplement the work of the DROs. Uh, CFRD published a homeless services page on the city website a substance misuse directory and a homeless services guide and map that we provided to a lot of community organizations and businesses that would see people coming in asking for help they didn't know where to go so it's a pocket size it folds to a pocket size guide that they can give people or people who are providing services can use to help them um, we increase lighting in some key areas we have several others um, to be done moving forward and one of the recommendations was for public restrooms downtown, and we are currently 
constructing two garages, and both of those will have public restrooms. One of the other um, major recommendations was with that increasing official presence downtown was to have someone who could be the eyes and ears of the city downtown. And so we hired an after hours ambassador, Jenna Whitaker, who is here. She can't even wave. Uh, and she started uh, work in July. And Jenna's job is to help create a sense of welcome in the downtown area. Um, and she, she works a lot with our social worker, with the BPD social worker, with the DROs, with social service agencies. But she, some of the highlights of what she's done is established an, a multi-agency partnership with various agencies that are involved in safety so that they are communicating better and looking for opportunities to collaborate. She's working with Centerstone and our BPD social worker, other community partners to connect communities, to connect, connect citizens or residents to services in the community. She's developed a survey to find out what people are experiencing downtown, what some of the gaps are, what some of the needs might be. Um, she's, again, you all can read, but researching and working cross-departmentally to implement best practices for scooters and, and ride hailing, overall curb management. She's teamed with our uh, Economic and Sustainable Development Department in educating our food truck vendors and um, working on compliance, assess sanitation needs downtown, attempting to decrease traffic congestion downtown by working with Uber and Lyft, and city staff to develop uh, pickup and drop off zones for Uber and Lyft, um, and continuing to educate the public about how to use our U Report system. So it's been six months, Jenna's been very busy. Um, she's been working with a lot of different departments um, and, and a lot of community partners and, and attending a lot of meetings, but uh, has really been an asset to the community and is really making a difference in the downtown. So looking ahead and moving forward, um, since the community coordinating coalition or council is, has finished its work, we're forming a new team that will look at data and assess data related to safety, civility, and justice. So that, that team is forming. Um, Chief Decoff mentioned the Crisis Diversion Center, which I have learned is going to be called the Stride Center. Uh, he didn't know that. Um, <laughs> and that's, that's a partnership between the Gov Monroe County Government Centerstone, IU Health Foundation, City of Bloomington. Um, we are also helping to coordinate, helping Bloomington Monroe which is an online portal that people can access 24 hours a day uh, to find services. You can go in, you type in your zip code, you tell them what service you're in need of, and all of the services that are available pop up. You're able to make appointments online, apply online, um, get calls. And so it'll be helpful for people who can access it online, but also very helpful, just like that paper guide was, for people who are trying to assist people in need of services. And then we're examining our city ordinances pertaining to graffiti and street lighting um, just to make sure that we are aligned with best practices and, and continuing to create an overall safe and welcoming environment downtown. So I don't have as many slides as Chief Decon, so that's it for me and I will introduce Chief Jason Moore. Thank you. So for those who don't know me, I'm Jason Moore. I'm the fire chief for the city of Bloomington. And I am uh, really thankful to be able to stand here before you today and give you some really great news. Um, so primarily, I want to thank Mayor Hamilton for this initiative. Um, I really love bragging about what our firefighters do. And we have a lot of people in the audience here that um, I think that we work with well. Um, so I'll just get into it, and we'll start looking at 2019. Um, I, I go through this during budget presentations and everything, and the mission of our department, and I don't need to read it slide for slide, I don't need to, to read it word for word to you, um, I've highlighted the really uh, important parts of it. And since, uh, since arriving as the chief, uh, we realize that we have a primary duty to respond, but we also uh, have a responsibility for the prevention of, which we look at a lot of things that we'll talk about. We get into public education. And then if it gets that bad, then we focus on making sure that those emergencies are mitigated and dealt with quickly. And um, as we have proven, three years running, uh, there have been zero fire fatalities within the city of Bloomington. So I really would like to put this in perspective. Uh, we have a lot of tools at our disposal, 
uh, one of which is a national program that looks at uh, census data, it looks at uh, all the communities across the U.S. And by their standards, uh, they said Bloomington could expect up to eight fatalities a year. So we are well below what they are predicting for us, and we are also well below our, our historical averages. So, Our fire department personnel, uh, what we'd like to highlight on this for 2019 is we've added an additional staff in 2019. I've got Robert uh, Levisic, our logistics officer here today. Um, a lot of people didn't realize um, the importance of this. In 2016, uh, when I arrived, our firefighters were buying their own gear. And uh, after doing our first uh, compliance inspection, 91 sets of those, those 100 sets failed. And I won't let you know they failed. Um, so it was really an important uh, initiative for the city to take over the purchasing of that gear. Not only did we take that on, uh, we've also looked at cancer prevention protocols which in our line of work, they're starting to find that we are dying younger and younger uh, because of the things we're being exposed to. So not only <clears throat> did the city commit to buying a set of gear for every firefighter, they committed to buying two. A lot of people are, well, that's kind of a waste, but uh, what we're doing is making sure that when they go into a fire, uh, our logistics officer comes out, they change out gear right then and there, and those carcinogens are never put back on a firefighter's body, nor are they really coming back to the stations where your kids and my kids come and visit. So uh, it's a really uh, neat initiative, but it really does look out for the community. It looks out for our firefighters. Uh, other responsibilities, uh, again, thanks to all the taxpayers and the council for their support, we've had more new equipment than we've ever had in the past. So we also want to make sure we're maintaining that equipment. We're following up and, and keeping up with everything, and that's uh, another responsibility of logistics officers develop all those programs. Stations and apparatus, uh, we have not had any really major changes in our stations. You can see the dots where we're spaced out. Uh, but we did uh, make a, a change with the purchase of the new aerial. For the first time in, in a very long time, we actually have a reserve aerial. Um, so even a brand new truck needs maintenance, oil changes, just like you would on your regular car. Uh, we now have the capability to maintain that 100-foot aerial service all the time in the city uh, without having to borrow a neighboring department's apparatus. So. Um, by the end of this year, uh, with the purchasing that we're, we're looking at, the entire front line, so that's all the, the primary response vehicles, will be brand new. Uh, that is a huge change from the, the days of, of 2016 when, when I got here, looking at the condition of our fleet, and uh, we're very proud of that. So with prevention, uh, we talk about our three E's, education, enforcement, and engineering. Um, so education, uh, if you were to look at this from last year, you'll see a, a significant decline in our total numbers. But part of that is when I got here, we had to set goals. And then we had to evaluate if those goals were appropriate or if they were meeting the intended action. Um, so a lot of our goal setting and the things we're looking at now, we're looking more at the uh, outcome of those, not just a, a sole number of how many. Um, so an example of this would be, uh, we were going into elementary school sometimes three or four times uh, from kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and we started looking at information retention. And what we realized real quickly is we don't need to focus so much on kindergartners and first grade. We still have those, but until they hit second grade, they really weren't retaining the information. So showing up three, four, or five times actually did no good prior to that. Um, so again, this is a more focused approach. We have limited resources, and we want to make sure we get the biggest impact for what we do have. Enforcement, uh, these are the fire inspections. Uh, so this is everything from someone complaining about an issue, and I think uh, the U report has, has helped us with a lot of that. The pre-plans, uh, we like to call that the friendly face of the fire department because when our inspectors come out, most business owners frown upon it because it normally costs money to update you know, this, that, or the other. Um, they don't particularly like seeing us when we say, you can't block these doors. Whatever it is, uh, it's not always the friendliest face of the department. But with the pre-plans, we're sending the operational crews out to learn the buildings, to learn about our citizens. Um, you know, it's a big difference when you go in blind to a building and then when you go blind and all you know is what you can see this far in front of you. So getting a layout, learning what's important, uh, especially with business owners, not only are we looking at the business itself, but we, we ask them uh, questions like, if all the people were out, obviously, what's the next thing you would want us to save? So for some people, they love their paper, it's this filing cabinet, this is my whole life. For other people, it's this, this particular computer, that's, that's all of our business records, we need it. So again, this is just overall better, better service to our customers. Uh, which are the citizens. Fire investigations, uh, fires are down, uh, but we have been investing heavily in getting to the cause of all these fires, training our investigators. Um, I would say that I am very pleased with our uh, collaboration with BPD. 
Um, from what we can tell, every fire that has been a uh, potential arson that was identified as a legitimate arson, we have actually caught that person, uh, which does drive down overall fire numbers when you don't have someone that's getting away with a fire that starts multiple. And then engineering, uh, if anybody has any issues, you can look around. Building is, building is happening everywhere. Uh, we have a very uh, big role in reviewing all those plans and making sure that they're meeting all the needs, that they're not creating safety hazards that we would then have an issue with in the future. For training, again, we're very proud of this. Uh, we met well over our goal at 109%. Over the years, we've kind of tapered that goal back down. So we set the goal. Our firefighters, uh, I think the first year were somewhere around 180% or 150% of the, the total goal. Um, but we want them well trained, but we also have a lot of other things we need to do. So this year, uh, we were closer to our goal, um, which is where we really would like to be. And I always tell people um, that, you know, to become a firefighter, there's a certain level of training. And then every new thing a fire department does, there's reoccurring training to make sure that you are a professional when you show up. And it's not, you know, I haven't done that in two or three years. And now all of a sudden, I'm being asked to do it under stress. Uh, we took, uh, you know, a lot of pride in our department. We really wanted to look at our employee safety and health, mandated uh, physical fitness routines. Um, I think we've started getting trending analysis from our, our uh, annual physicals. Um, I really wish we had data from the year before we started going with this new company uh, because from what, what we've been told by our provider, uh, the department in whole has lost almost a ton of weight. <laughs> So a, a metric ton, almost 2,000 pounds of weight loss between all of our firefighters. Um, and that is attributed to adding extra equipment. Uh, you know, we've been re evaluating our equipment, getting different types. Uh, we've added peer fitness uh, trainers that can help our firefighters develop programs. Um, and again, it's, it's really important to us that they are, uh, you know, pretty close to legitimate athletes when you have an emergency. <laughs> So let's get into the thing that everybody knows us for. It's the red trucks with the lights, and this is what we call our operations. Um, I really want to tell you that we have looked at um, historical data, um, and what we've been trying to do since I've been here is, is really time out when we start doing enforcement activities to try to level these, these peaks out. Um, but what we saw in 2019 is something that was unprecedented in all of our recorded history, uh, which I have data going back to 2006. We actually had a 11.5% increase in total call volume. That has never happened in our department. Um, looking at that, you know, there are several things that we could consider. Uh, rescue EMS calls, um, as the, the number of citizens increase, you have more medical calls. Uh, we did see some up increase because of scooters. Uh, we've had other increases through uh, some of the expansion of social service programs um, where they're requesting help more often. Uh, but when we really get down to it, um, I, what I want to tell you is we're focusing on the things that are killing people more, and then we're starting to develop plans on how to deal with all the other things, such as false alarms. So even though we had an overall increase in fires, uh, it is well below our historical average of 353 fires a year, and that is really coming down to the prevention activities and the education activities. Um, again, this is the first time uh, in our history we've broken 4,000 calls for service in a year. Uh, IU is a big part of what we do, and we've been tracking some of their data separately. Uh, when you look at the overall, uh, there was definitely a, an inclination for students arriving and departing that affected our call volume. Uh, we have been trying to focus on educational programs at peak times, uh, and to be honest, we've never had a better working relationship with the university than what we do now. Um, so previous to uh, the, the past three years of working with them, we've never been in, involved in student orientation programs. We've never been involved in uh, the RA, <coughs> the residential programs. And what we're doing now, we're seeing the results from. <coughs> and again, you can see for uh, IU, um, they did have a plus four in their fires, but they're still well below their average. I think we're sitting somewhere around 53 fires a year is the historical average. So uh, we're, we're extremely excited about limiting the le legitimate dangers to their health. And we're gonna be focusing on fire alarms and other things uh, when we get into 2020 plans. So fire fatalities and saves, again, we're very proud of no fatalities in the past three years. Um, some people would ask what was the change, and unfortunately we changed so much, uh, it's hard to pinpoint one thing. Uh, so the increase in training, uh, the equipment, when we looked at some of the apparatus that had to sit there and warm up and build up air pressure for several minutes, that goes into a prolonged response time which may lead to death. 
Um, you know, again, when we look at all the factors, what we do know is we've had zero uh, for three years in a row, and we've had multiple saves every year. Um, so for that, we really do want to thank our firefighters um, for, for taking their job seriously, and in some cases, putting themselves in, in some significant risk to pull uh, citizens out. Um, and I would show you the, the graph on the right. Those are our fire calls. Um, again, we've seen this historical trend of they've gone up and down, up and down, but we've been on an overall negative trend, even with a slight increase this year. Um, by the way, the uh, serial arsonist at the end of the year in December really messed up our, we were going we to be at another loss for fires this year, and then that one put us over the top for, for last year's numbers. But they were caught, and we're dealing with that. Uh, response times, you know, when someone calls 911, they really just care about getting help there quickly and enough help. Uh, we set goals along with the national standards of the four minute and eight minute response times. Uh, we were unable to meet the four minutes, um, but we've always been looking at why and how. Um, so what we found is the only reason we can't meet some of those response goals, uh, major construction, anybody had any issues going east or west? I know our public works director is going to hate me for this, um, but they're necessary, as we all know. They need to be improved so that we don't have continued issues. Uh, we had simultaneous calls for service. Um, again, some of the things we've done to help that is the quick response vehicle, the squad, um, that can take medical calls. It doesn't take a large truck out of service to be able to do that. And then the last one is uh, calls that are outside of the one and a half mile um, radius from a station. So that's kind of the, the ISO model of uh, a fire station every mile and a half for an engine, every two and a half miles for an aerial. Um, but what I can tell you, uh, at 83% for four minutes, um, to get to a 90 percentile, uh, we're at about five minutes, which is still, still very good response times. And then we did meet our within eight minutes of 98%. Uh, the mayor mentioned our ISO rating. Uh, what I want to tell you is it didn't change. It won't change. We get evaluated about every five years. Uh, but we have made a lot of preparations so that when we are reevaluated, I believe it's in 2022, that we should be pushing into the ISO 1, which is the, a perfect score for a fire department. Um, when you look at the ratings, uh, a 1 to 10, 1 is the best, 10 is the worst. Uh, 10 essentially means you have no fire protection. Um, to get to about a six, you need to have a fire station and a fire truck and somebody that says I'm a firefighter. And then beyond that, it gets infinitely harder um, to, to move further up that scale. Um, so what you'll see is uh, not only improvements in equipment, uh, the way that we're doing business, the way that we have firefighters available, the staffing levels, uh, but uh, other big portions are the pre-plans and the training and some of the, uh, the intangibles that, that you know, people don't realize that happens behind the scenes. Uh, we are very proud of this ISO rating, and we still are the highest rated department in Monroe County. Something that we look at, uh, this is another national standard, it's uh, the National Fire Protection Association 1710, and what that looks at is they have recommendations based on the type of uh, structures we go to fires, on how many firefighters it takes to meet the needs of that building, um, and for uh, another year running, uh, we've, we throw what we can at the issues uh, and we make justifications towards looking at additional staff. For single family uh, house fires, we, we're well within the range of what we need. We get into strip malls, uh, we, could, we can almost meet the, the national benchmarks, but we have uh, built some policies and procedures to help us be efficient while we're at it. When we get to high rise, uh, we're looking at having to recall off-duty firefighters um, because honestly we don't have a lot of incidents in those types of buildings. But if we ever do, it's going to require a lot more uh, personnel than what we have available on staff at any given time. Uh, administration, uh, our budget fluctuates quite a bit. You know, some of our projects, uh, a new apparatus, for instance, uh, is, is between 500,000 and a million dollars. So we operated in 2019 with about $500,000 less. Uh, we're still not upset. We just went from buying a million dollar truck in 2018 to a $500,000 truck in 2019. So thank you, Mayor Hamilton and the administration for that. Um, and that is the one that will be here, and we should be announcing a push-in ceremony for that uh, here relatively quickly. Um, so again, we've talked about the 100-foot aerial. By the way, for those that wanted to know, we did push it in. It was not in reverse. Okay. Some people have thought that we did something weird and disabled the backup alarms. Uh, that was completely citizen power and firefighter power pushing that into the station. Uh, we will discuss Station 3. It's got a pretty big incline. We may have to cheat on that one. Um, so anyway, uh, but we are almost done with the second round uh, of our second set of gear. This year, by contract, we had to have the second set for every firefighter. 
and those have been ordered, so we are well within compliance, and we are moving forward with, with a lot of our cancer prevention protocols. So big projects, uh, we did a fire condition, uh, fire station assessment, looking at all five of our buildings, uh, how bad off are they, what do they need. Um, you know, we can get into the details of it. Uh, they, it is available on the Be Clear portal. But uh, what we wanted to know was a clear picture of where do we go from here, not just, uh, you know, basically some of the issues were throwing money just to, to try to keep things running. We wanted to evaluate the overall impact and if it was still a valid investment. Um, again, the logistics officer cancer prevention protocols. Um, we're one of the few departments in the nation that, that do a full gear swap. There's different variations of them that are out there. Um, it's still not fully to where we want it to be, where again, the, the central gear washing facility, things of that nature. Um, but what we do know is that our firefighters are better taken care of and the gear is not only compliant, uh, it's exceptional gear which allows them to do their job without fear. The NFPA 1500, that's a firefighter safety and health program. Last year we focused on completing all the OSHA. Uh, we had an external OSHA inspector that came back with a few other things that we had to correct. But our workplaces are now safer than they've ever been. And the, the 1500 standards uh, get into policies, procedures, and we start reevaluating our department on how we're operating. Uh, we've always pushed on an increased presence in the K through 12. Uh, there was a point in our history where we, we lost that, uh, which that is, uh, gets into the community uh, immunity type stuff. You know, if you lose it for a couple years, then you have a whole group of adults 20 years later that don't know all the fire safety. Uh, so we have been making sure that we get heavily involved in those and restart those programs. And we're having a lot of really good uh, uh, dialogue with our, our counterparts at MCCSC and the other schools. Uh, we also did one large scale emergency preparedness drill. So uh, for those of you that don't know, we actually do practice what we try to do. Um, and we have a lot of hypothetical discussions. Uh, but IU was, was very uh, generous. We were involved in a large scale drill. They did a, a full scale, which is very difficult to pull off. Um, and we participated in that, and not only did we learn a lot of lessons, I think uh, overall it was just good for us to test some of our models and, and how we respond to, to events on IU campus. So 2019 goals, there's a lot of check marks and I don't really need to go through those. Those are things we did well. Uh, there's again information on the portal, though I did want to point out uh, the one that was read, that is a goal that we missed. Uh, we did accomplish significant progress on it, but we set a goal to be in every occupancy every year. Now, that hand deals with all the residential where people live, but this is where people work and where people you know, have industrial type uh, situations. Um, we have been evaluating for a few years, how do we do that? We have now leveraged every piece of technology. So now we're looking at, is there a potential of self-inspections for those that are compliant um, and a lot of other programming that may help us reach this. But what we do know is that when someone sees a firefighter at least once a year, they generally have a much lower risk of fire. So that is our end goal. In 2020, join me in thanking them for their service and their
if that just overcame you with information, <laughs> no, that's fine. Okay. I have a question for Chief Peacock about race and policing. So one of the slides that you displayed was about the Deep Clear Portal. Yes. Which is a fantastic resource as a journalist, I have to say. <laughs> um, so let me tell you something about the water main uh, great database. It's incredibly detailed. It has stuff in there that no member of the public would even know what to do with. <laughs> uh, the relative depth of the pipe, the material of the pipe, all, all kinds of stuff. And I asked Vic Kelson, this is fantastic, but what's it there for? And his answer was, that's the data that we need the department to figure out what's going on with our own flood. So there's a data set that the police department puts up on citation. It's it has some features that are similarly arcane. It includes the race of the officer making the citation. It includes uh, the race of the person who was cited. So to me that says the department thinks these data points are important. Um, and it makes me wonder how does the department use that data? Uh, so when I go through it, I can, I mean, I can add numbers together and I, the, the numbers I get are something like 12% of the citations are uh, given to uh, black people. That's about, I mean, that's different from the roughly 4% of the black population we have here in the world. So I can also divide numbers that I can say that's three times the, the number you would expect if it were just random. So to me, it's not fair to draw any conclusion based on that, but it is fair to ask a question. Uh, sure. So, Two questions, how does the department use those data points in its review of its own internal performance? And uh, second, is there additional data that you can think of <coughs> that you could provide to help us in the community study the question of what, whether there is in fact racial disparity in the way uh, Bloomington Police Department is applying the law? Sure, so I think, I think a couple of things you need to take into account. Yes, Bloomington's pop African American population is around 4%, um, but Bloomington also is a regional destination and we, we tend to draw visitors from outside of the community. So that is one of the things that we look at. Also is when we look at um, arrest information and citation information is where actually people um, are from. So that's important information to look at because um, Visitors to our community don't always follow the laws either, so we sometimes have to take enforcement action um, uh, on, those, on those types of violations. So the way we use that information, though, is we, we constantly are reviewing that type of, uh, those types of calls, those types of stops, those types of interactions um, to make sure that we don't have officers that are uh, particularly focusing on one um, race of, of, of persons to take action against. Um, and there are a variety of ways that we do that. We have um, tracking systems that we use. Um, we have supervisors that are reviewing the work activity of officers. We do random checks of uh, body cam video um, and we do random checks of uh, just activity levels of each officer um, and compare that information with uh, their colleagues and we also look at um, the the standards and the, and the population data and the visitor data that we have um, to make sure that we don't have an officer that is um, disproportionately enforcing the law against a particular race um, so there there's there's it, it twofold the reason that we release a lot of that information is for journalists to look at and see and ask those questions but we also use that information internally where we do our own um, checks to make sure that our officers are equally enforcing the law and not particularly focusing on one uh, one race over another. I don't know if that answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'll just look. The history of America and the history of this community uh, is part of that story. Uh, the relationship between police departments and people of color and, and other, other uh, groups of individuals have been 
complicated. There have certainly, there's, there's reasons in the last few years that we've paid more attention to that and we need to. Uh, Bloomington is not immune from um, conflicts and interactions. Uh, as the chief said, the first and most first step is making sure we are transparent about that. I'm really proud that this department is a leader not only in the state but really across the country in sharing that information uh, so that we open the doors uh, and and with academics and community members and others to try to identify ways we can get better. Um, in addition, for example, the, um, the bias reporting that we do and investigations that we do here in the city, again, a leader in the state. Um, we, can't, we can't pretend we've got it all figured out, uh, and I think it's really important to keep the doors wide open. As I often say, the more our police know about our community, the better, and the more our community knows about our police department, the better. And that's what part of this is about. So thanks for asking about it. Anything else? Well, you've been a patient and attentive crew. Uh, thank you so much uh, for attending the annual public safety report. We appreciate it. Thank you.